you're here for a reason. That That's a very, very important one. When we can figure out what it is that our purpose is, why we're here, because we're not just random something or others. We are actually people who are here for a reason. And uh, finding that allows us to really put our energy, direct our energy in the way in which we want it to go. Hello and welcome to Passion Harvest. I am so honored to have Dr. Gladys McGarry on the show today. She is 102 years old and a doctor that reveals her powerful and life-changing secrets to live with joy, vitality and purpose at any age. Dr. Gladys McGarry began her medical practice at a time when woman, women couldn't even own their own bank accounts. She teaches you how to spend your energy wildly in order to embrace your life fully and feel motivated every day. Dr. McGarry is the co-founder of the American Holistic Medical Association and the author of The Well-Lived Life. Dr. McGarry, welcome to Passion harvest i'm happy to be here <laughs> um normally we don't discuss women's age but you're over 100 my gosh what a life you've experienced amazing really it put, i'm in awe of what, <laughs> what the world has done since i you know been alive on this planet so <clears throat> how does it feel to live over 100 years and the incredible changes that you've experienced and seen and witnessed it's awesome it's absolutely awesome because <clears throat> there's no way along the path since i've grown up that i could have ever imagined being able to talk to you this way you know this mm -hmm. very moment is so awesome in the scheme of things when when i was a kid we didn't even have phone you know well actually that the school had a phone but i don't know who they had to, to talk to but uh but the a telephone was not available to us <laughs> yes and to talk across continents it's it's just oh. incredible when I, when I was born the only uh, in india in fatigar india the only way that my father had to let my family in Cincinnati know was to send a cablegram, which meant that this message went under the wa water across the Atlantic, and <clears throat> every uh, every thing that was said. I mean, every every uh, not just the word, but the uh, and any thing from the alphabet that was said used had to be paid for separately. So the message that I have it here, but the message that my grandmother got, she lived in Cincinnati. Her name was Seal, S-I-E-H-L. So the, the telegram said, Seal, Aiken, Aiken Avenue, Cincinnati, period, for the address. That was all. And the, the message was, girl, well, Taylor. So that was, my dad's name was Taylor, okay? So my grandmother got to know that she had a granddaughter now who was born in, in India. But, uh, you know, uh, it, that, was a, 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 it was, that was considered awesome. And I think it's awesome. Imagine having that message go under the... Amazing. Uh, I, so how did she know. get the message on a piece of paper and it was delivered to her home? No, it was a, uh, what's called a... Um, cablegram. Cablegram. Like, in, like a, well, it was like a cablegram and it was brought to her home. Okay. Fantastic. Well... Amazing, amazing. A, a big congratulations on your book, The Well-Lived Life. 
Thank you. Um, yeah. And I will leave a link in the show notes below for people to click on that. You have six secrets to live life with joy, vitality, passion and purpose. Would you mind sharing some of those secrets from your 100 plus years to the Passion Harvest <clears throat> audience? Not at all. Uh, the first one is you're here for a reason. You know, that, that's a very, very important one. When we can figure out <clears throat> what it is that our purpose is, why we're here, because we're not just random something or others. We are actually people who are here for a reason. And... uh Finding that allows us to really put our energy, direct our energy in the way in which we want it to go. So <clears throat> we're here for a reason. It's like a huge jigsaw puzzle, like the, like the world is a huge jigsaw puzzle. And we're individual pieces within that jigsaw puzzle. Every... Uh, part of our being affects the other parts of the world, but no one else can take our place. So it, when we recognize who we are and who what it is that we came to do to, to, to allow this uh, message of life itself become what it needs to be, that's when life gets so exciting. But I'm just saying, how? What if we don't find our purpose? How do we? How do we find it? Well, you won't find it if you're not looking for it. First of all, <clears throat> it's like for anything else. Uh, uh, if you're looking for the light, you'll find the light. But if you're not looking for the light, you'll never find it. It'll all be darkness. It depends on what you're looking for. It's like if you're <laughs> reaching for the light, like E.T. was doing in <laughs> looking for home, you'll find it. But if you're always looking for the darkness over your shoulder, like right reaching over your right shoulder, maybe, your neck's going to get stiff and it's going to get stuck there. But if you're looking for the light, you'll see it and the light moves and you'll move and things will go on. So the, looking for your purpose is like that. It's like looking for what it is that lights my path, what it is that I need to see, what it is that I want to see. And we can get so caught up in our, in our humanness, in our daily life, whether it's family and children and work that we often forget pieces of ourself and why we why we are here well it's very easy to have that happen <clears throat> you know because uh life throws us uh curves and sometimes awful things happen and we can get stuck in that but we can stay stuck in that it's like if i cut my arm here and I spend time picking at that scab, it's never going to get healed. But if I look at that and see and do something to help it heal, it's, and then just look, stop picking at it, it'll heal. And sometimes we'll look back on it, I'll look, see the scab and say, oh yeah, I know who you are, but it's not going to hurt. It's, it's a different uh, feeling when you see something that you've lived through and it's done what it needs to do, taught you the lessons that you need to learn, and you've gone on with it. Thank you so much. So aside from, I mean, number one, passion and purpose and, and finding your purpose in life, what are some of the other secrets to live a life well, filled with joy? One of it is that I just mentioned, <clears throat> and that is that everything has a purpose. And so what when we're looking for our purpose, look for what you're doing 
in life, what's what's going on in your life, what it is that you uh, see and you, that makes you sit up and think, take notice, and what it is that makes you sort of want to just go back to bed. You know, it's the it's the uh, part. See, I've sort of constructed what I call the five L's. It, in years gone, it's not. It's not a, a uh, theology or anything. It's just that the way I help, it helps me construct the way I live and the way it works for me. <clears throat> and the first two L's are life and love. They are, actually, they can't function without the other. A seed can, can be in the pyramid for 5,000 years never able to do anything until love in the form of light and water and so on softens its shell and it breaks the shell and it can begin to live. Those two are actually one unit. It's like a pregnancy. The sperm and the ovum come together and begin to grow and the mother and the baby become one unit. The baby knows what the mother knows, and the baby hears what the mother hears and eats what the mother eats. It's one unit for however long it is, nine months, seven months, however. <clears throat> but that baby becomes its own person when that aspect of its bringing those two energies, life and love, together is manifested as it takes its first breath, then it becomes its own unit. But until then, those two are are really one unit. But when, when it claims itself, when it becomes who it really is and takes its first breath, then it becomes that person. So <clears throat> then the third L is laughter. Laughter without love is cruel, it's mean, it breaks up families, it causes wars. But laughter with love is joy and happiness. It's what gives us the light, it's what allows us to really find who it is that we were, we are. So <clears throat> I have a nice little story to tell here. I have a great grandson who is now probably eight months old and they were go wanting to go to Mexico so they had to get a, a passport but when they tried to get this baby to pose for his passport he started giggling and he wouldn't stop and the people that were trying to take the picture would say make him close his mouth well, this kid was happy. He was laughing so hard. He wasn't about to close his mouth. It took him a very long time to get that passport picture. I think that's delightful. Anyway, that's that's the third L. The fourth L is labor. Oh, my life is too hard. There are too many things go to the ground. We just drag ourselves to work. And it's in too many diapers, too, too much. It's too much. But laughter, I mean, but, but labor with love is bliss. It's why you're doing what you're doing. It's why I'm doing what I'm doing. It's what makes our hearts sing. It's, it's actually the juice that we can function with. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Without love, without love, labor just drags on and you just can hardly get through it all. We work 15 times as hard to, do, to work with love because it juices us. It allows us to get the energy. With, with, uh, without that, you just drag yourself through it and do what you have to do. And the fifth one is listening. Listening without love is empty sound. You can, you know, hear something and not understand it and just 
check it off. Or you can hear something that's really important and you take it in and think, oh, that's what I'm looking for. It's understanding. Listening with love is understanding. Otherwise, it's empty sound. It doesn't mean anything. So those five L's have yeah. helped me to structure my life. It all comes down to love. Absolutely. What, love what, is a great healer. What's your, you kind of just mentioned it, but what's your advice for the audience if someone, how, do, how does one change their life if they're not happy with what they're experiencing? You choose. It's what you choose to you know, we all have, see, I have this other idea. This is not a theology. This is just an idea I have. And it makes sense to me. Well, this okay. is your show today, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When God, whoever God or whatever God is to any one of us, you know, it's a personal thing. Whatever God is, when the earth was created, God looked at the earth and it was beautiful. I mean, this was perfect. Everything was where it should be. Everything was doing what it should be. And then he created the human being. And he said to us as human beings, you're the only beings on this world who have choice and free will. I now give you dominion over the earth and we in our arrogance thought he said dominance. So we've kind of taken over and done what we want to do with poor Mother Earth. She suffered so hard. But not, that's not what the, the divine energy that gave us who we are really wanted us to do. And that's where we can choose what it is, that, that how we live. In other words, if we're stuck in a hard place, we can choose to stick there or we can start looking for the light. It depends on what we choose to do. It's a it's a matter of, you know, just picking at that scab or letting, put, letting it heal and working with it and letting <clears throat> ourselves to listen, you know, my mother taught me something when I was a, a, a girl and then on through. In fact, my sister and I didn't even recognize what it was until we were in our 90s, I think. And one day we'd be, we were talking to each other and we'd just take our hand and let it drop like this. You know, it was just let it drop. And we said to each other, why do we do that? And we said, we don't know. And then we said, who did it? And we said, our mother did it. We realized who we remembered. And then we said, and she said something. What did she say when she dropped her arm like that? Ah, we both remembered at the same time. The words that she used was, ah, kuchmarani, which means, oh, it doesn't matter. And that has been a freeing statement for me all my life. In other words, People say something that's nasty. You can take it in and say, oh, that hurt my feelings. And it ruins your whole day. <clears throat> it ruins people's lives. It ruins whatever is going on. Or you can say, oh, it doesn't matter. Coach put one in, you let it go, and you don't even remember it. So it's that kind of <clears throat> choice that we as human beings have. And if we don't recognize that and don't allow ourselves to step up to that, we'll just go on feeling horrible and think we're stuck in the dark places where we don't really need to. So it's where what we're looking for. And that I'm not saying that it's condemnation. We all get into places like that where where it feels like they're not but when we do, when we realize that uh, 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 no no there's little et looking for home it's i we, 
we as true human beings can continue to look for our true humanity. And I think that's what our juice is. It's our true humanity. Or we can just go on, you know, feel dragged and drag ourselves through through life. Mm. It's our choice. And 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 let me tell you, there isn't a one of us who haven't gone through hard times and painful times and all kinds of things that you you know you don't want to live with of course i mean in our humanness there's no doubt we'll all experience suffering or loss <laughs> or grief i want to move on to that in a minute i just want to ask you a question and you spoke about if someone has done wrong by you we can often get so caught up in our thoughts this person did this to me and it it's almost like a cycle that perpetuates right Again, I guess maybe, well, I'll, I'm not going to answer your question, but it, it doesn't matter, you know, because we can get caught up and tell ourselves the story and relive the experiences. Well, if you take it in and say, that hurt me, mm. then it hurts you. If you can say, oh, that's not important, Kuchpurwani, it doesn't matter. It's just and it, that person's opinion. It, if you don't agree with that opinion you don't have to take it in it says we all have a choice we have a choice to uh, think another person is a, a good person or uh, whatever it is that we want to take in and we suffer for many incredibly different reasons and i I'd, I'd just like to move on to suffering or grief or loss are they're all aspects perhaps of the same thing and no doubt you've in your 100 plus years have experienced a lot of that what is your advice for the audience it's again the same thing you know that everything that happens to you to us is there for a reason i you know when, when i was a a young one living in the jungles of North India, I thought life was bliss. I mean, I was having a great time. The Indian kids and I were, and we were playing around. The Indian kids would rub the my arms to get try and get the white off. You know, now you know. <laughs> I think I love that, and and I didn't care. We were we knew what we were doing. So when I started school, my life turned upside down because I have, we didn't know what it was. It's called dyslexia. I, I'm a severe dyslexic. I can't, I could not read. I could not write. I could not add. I could not subtract because the numbers and the alphabet just shifted all over the page. And so I flunked first grade and the teacher called me the dumbbell. And the students called me the d stupid one. And and I had to repeat first grade. So for two years, I was actually, my psyche was injured very deeply as I thought of myself as this stupid person who couldn't uh, understand anything, except for the fact that I, at home, it was different. We, we were in the high, in the Himalayas. And when I, would climb the mountain to get up to where my house was, my ayah, the Indian nurse who, more than a nurse, was, well, to be an ayah was like a person who steps into the person, to the family as a second mother. So my ayah, she was ignorant. She didn't know how to read or write. She didn't know anything, but she knew how to love. And she would watch for me. She knew what I was going through. She'd watch me come up the hill and she'd stretch out her chadra, her her, uh, her scarf, her head scarf. And she'd see me come up and she'd say, Israel, come here. And I'd come over and climb in under that shawl and sit there until my life came back into focus and I could go on with it. But I had the blessing of choosing within my soul what it was that 
that I needed to work with. And this aspect of love that she was reaching out to me really helped me through those times until I got into third grade and the teacher there saw something in me that I that the other one hadn't seen and she appointed me class governor. So I got to take what we did in third grade and uh, uh, take the message to the rest of the student body. But I didn't really find my voice until I was 93. <laughs> I love that. So I've got a while to go. <laughs> yeah. The thing was, you know, my my psyche was so damaged by those two first years that I I would I you know I had written uh, five books, but I had I kept having people as I was writing those books, I had to have people check what I had written. I'd take it to my husband or have somebody else check it so that I was sure. I was writing the same things. Mm -hmm. However, when I was 93, one morning I had a dream. I, 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 because I've found through the years that my dreams are very, very important if I pay attention to them. So it's a matter of, and, and finding guidance through my dreams has been very important too. So anyway, I woke up this Sunday morning with a, um, a, a sort of a, a joyous feeling. And what I saw in the dream was that I saw myself as nine-year-old Gladys peeking out of our tent in the jungle, pulling the back of the tent flap and making sure my younger brother wasn't out there because if he was out there, he would t tattle on me. <laughs> And I'd be penished, so I didn't want that. So he wasn't there. And I ran as fast as I could, climbed the, the mango tree, clear up to the top, and started singing. Now, the thing was that in our, in our home at that time, we were not allowed to sing anything but hymns or bhajans on a Sunday morning. And this was, a, I knew, it was a Sunday morning. And I wanted to sing any old thing that I wanted to sing. And I thought that this rule was stupid. So I was sitting up in the mango tree singing. I'm singing the caterpillar song or I'm singing anything else that I want to sing. And every so often I stop singing. And I look over my right shoulder and Jesus is up in the tree with me. Now, I'm looking at Jesus and he's laughing. And I say to him, Jesus loves the little children, right? And he's laughing and he says, yes. And I go back to the singing. And then after a while, I get to thinking, did he really say yes? You know, this old doubt thing crept in again. And I look back over my shoulder and I say, I'm still a little children, right? And he says, yes. And I go back to the singing, and I woke up singing and laughing and realizing that if Jesus thinks my voice is okay and that I can use it and use it the way I want to, I better just start using it. And so from that point on, I really trusted the, the thoughts that were coming to me, the dreams that were coming to me, and I didn't have to check them all the time, but on you know be, make sure that somebody else realized that they those things I was saying were okay. But you know it's it's you take one step at a time, you do it with what you can do, and go as far as you can go with that. My mother called it make do. She said you know you you use what you've got at hand and make do. That's what uh, it's a great word to ask her, at, to do, have a, a vocabulary is to make do whatever it is, whatever in the, and there's where your choice and free will come in. 
And this is where we really claim who and what we are. And when we do that, let me tell you folks, life gets really interesting and fun and exciting and it gets better as we get older. Yes, and what a beautiful experience meeting Jesus. And, you know, we so often don't believe ourselves to be worthy in whatever way that may be, but to not look externally for validation, it's 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 beautiful. Yeah, whoever, G, whoever the, the higher aspect of ourself is, we look towards that. You know, no matter what religion we are, uh, that I think we need to find how within our, our own culture we fit. But we have to choose. Mm. Thank you. You talk about, you know, our, our traumas, our sufferings, and how important it is to learn from those experiences. Would you mind just exploring that a little bit more? Well, try living two two years as a dyslexic kid who's the, uh, the stupid one, you know. I learned, during those years, I learned to fight. I mean, and my, my brother showed me how to land a punch because the kids really, really did pick on me. I was the stupid one. You know, uh, that's that's a soul injury. It's a deep injury that that a child feels when they're whatever it is, whether you've been neglected or abused or whatever it is that's going on with that. It's it's a aspect of yourself that's that's been hurt and damaged, and uh, sometimes it takes the rest of your life. To, to begin to see what there is there in your life that, like my mother said, make do. Use what's there to make yourself happy, not to make yourself feel worse. At least at home, my family saw me as worth something. It was at the school place where I was injured, but at home... I was important. And it's that finding what it is that's important to us that makes us feel and understand that really we have, we're like that jigsaw puzzle, there isn't anybody else that can fill in that place. And when we find that and can work with it, life really, honest to goodness, begins to come alive within us and it's and it's a, a great thing and let me tell you that wasn't the only hard time I've had in my life you know I'm life sure. dishes out big doses of happiness and big doses of pain so what are we going to choose yes and for the audience what's your advice for for those that are experiencing grief or the loss of a loved one? Well, if you've lost a loved one, you don't, you have not really lost them. They're just not there in the physical body. I call it, for me, it's going down memory lane because I have these amazing memories of people that I have loved and that they have loved me and I can, if I'm having trouble not sleeping at night, I can choose to go down memory lane and reactivate what I remember as that person. Like my sister. My sister was, is still a very active person in my life to the point where she... She lived to be 98 and uh, was healthy until the, the two weeks before she died. She got a uh, flu and, and, and died. But when she was just in the process of 
while making the transition, my, her youngest son and his wife were sitting beside her at the bed, and she all of a sudden began singing bhajans and, and, and hymns. And first her voice was very soft, but then it got stronger. And uh, she sang for two hours. And every so often she'd stop and say, and Aya is here. And that makes me, when I think about that, I have to really laugh because our Aya taught my sister and me to play the dholak, which is a two-sided drum, the Indian drum. My sister learned, but I couldn't sit still long enough. So she learned. And I, in my mind, I see the two of them moving into heaven, wherever, whatever that is, moving through the pearly gates, singing and drumming as they go along. I mean, that's when I, when I think of my sister now, she's still alive like that in my life with all the other wonderful things that we did together. And I, I can remember those. And I can, you know, really feel <laughs> the joy and the excitement of things that we did together. And the things that we snuck off and did together that, you know, I'm not going to tell you about. <laughs> but, you know, the memory, nobody can take our memory from us. Yes, That's she's a big still there. Memory. Absolutely. No one, and, and, what we choose to remember is our choice. It's and it goes it goes directly back to thoughts, whatever we choose yes. to think as well. Yeah, what you want to take into your soul, what you want to live with and live and live on, because that's a juice that juices. I mean, I have so many wonderful people who have made the, you know, I'm sitting here pretty much by myself. I don't have any of my... <laughs> They're all gone. <laughs> they can't check on me, and I can tell any stories I want to the yeah. way I want. <laughs> but, but the reality is that uh, they're still alive in my life. Just because they are in another dimension doesn't mean that I've checked out on them or they've mm -hmm. checked out on me. So interesting. So many people are afraid of dying and what may happen. Is that a fear for you? For me, it's sort of like going to sleep right. and having a dream. You know, I, I, I recognize that that's a path that we all take. And there come a time when I'll go to sleep and I'll wake up on the other side, whatever that means. Well, we all will. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> and then we can talk about it. <laughs> but at this point, it's something that our soul knows within ourselves, deep within ourselves, we know what's going to happen. But our brain hasn't quite put it together so that it's uh, real until we start thinking about it. And when we start thinking about it, it becomes real. Hmm. So it's a choice. Be either to be scared of dying. But you know, I have through the years, I have people who have come to me as patients, and they're so afraid of uh, something like, uh, oh, I don't know, not having the right diet or something, that they make themselves sick. In other words, Focusing on what you don't have or what's wrong. Uh, or they'll sit at the table and eat something and say, I know this is bad for me, but I'm going to eat it anyway. I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, if you know it's bad for you, you don't have to eat it. Mm. But you do if you feel that you have to. And sometimes you do have to eat it because you're in co company that you have to eat that. But but you have to understand that you don't have to 
say to yourself, this is bad for me. You know, you could say, these folks made this food for me, therefore, and you know, something like, with love, and I'll accept that part of this food. It may not be something, well, you know, you could. Yeah, or oh, I really feel like a piece of chocolate. <laughs> yes. And, and bless it. Mm. If you bless your food as you're taking it in, your body will understand it. Oh, Dr. Gladys, you're a wealth of information. I won't keep you too much longer. Just a few more questions, if you don't mind. Yes. Um, you've kind of, we, you've talked about this, of course, but heartbreak. What's your advice for those who have experienced romantic heartbreak? I think we all have it. <laughs> of course. My husband asked me for a divorce when I was 46 years old, and I thought, we were doing real well, and uh, I I couldn't imagine it. I I couldn't. It was something that was just absolutely. We had done so much work together. We'd we'd started the American Holistic Medical Association. We did, you know. I mean, in my mind, we had had a just a, yeah, great life, and then all of a sudden he asks for a divorce, and. I I just well there there was a time when I was coming back to my home which was empty and I was in my car and I'm driving down the I-10 and just screaming at God. I mean I was screaming at the world. I was screaming at everything and telling them how terrible it was that uh, what I was going through. And all of a sudden, I stopped my car, and I thought, you know, maybe, maybe and, a, and words came to me. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us be glad, rejoice and be glad in it. And the words, be glad, just hit me like a, you know, that's my name. Now, what are you going to do with that name? And I realized I have a license plate on my car. I can change that license plate. So I went home, and the next day I changed my license plate to be glad. And for for the rest of the time, I was practicing here in Phoenix, and I it was a long time. That was about 30 years that, that I was still in practice. And I realized that every time I got into my car, I ha had to walk past that be glad and have that attitude as I got into my car. Not only that, but everybody who was going to be driving behind me in town would see be glad. So it was a message that I took in for myself, but I wanted to share it with people that I met. So it, it was something that uh, allowed me to deal with the heartbreak and pain that I was feeling so that it wasn't something that would continue to damage me. Because I'm telling you, I was not a pretty sight. I mean, that was, I, I was so broken. But when I was able to take that and look at it from another perspective and realize that I could do something about it, it changed the whole thing. Oh, I love that. And, and not only did you work through it, but, you know, who knows whose life you changed when they saw that, that, that plate. And, you know, you don't just get over these things. People say, well, just get over it. You don't just get over it. The rejection. You have to live it through. You live through it. If you can live through it and really come up on the other side like that, it's worth something. You've learned something from it. And I think that that's that's our challenge and our choice. Dr. Gladys, what's your advice for those? <clears throat> and you spoke about it before, uh, briefly, as one grows older or even if they're younger and 
the children might have left home and they might not be with a partner that are perhaps experiencing a sense of loneliness or I don't even like the word boredom, but a, 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 a sense of isolation from the world. We're not alone. We're never alone. There's always somebody or some aspect of life um, that is around us that we can look to. Let me let me tell you another quick story. I had this wonderful friend named James, and he was he, we were just really good friends. And then he moved into uh, dementia. And we had to put him in a home where he was taken care of. And he was being taken care of, and it was all nice. But one day I took a little plant, a little pot with a little green plant in it, over to his his room. And I said, now, James, this is your plant. And it it's you, you have to take care of this plant. It's um, and I had no idea whether he was understanding what I was saying or not, but I said it's going to need water, and it's going to need sunshine, and I, I'm putting it in the window here. But you, you have it's your job to take care of that plant and love it. So I did that kind of a little talk, and then I left. And a week later, I came back, and he meets me at the door, and he says. Magic, magic, magic. And I said, what, James, what's magic? And he says, he goes like, come, come. And he woke, walks over to the wall where the, the box for the air conditioning was. And he says, push this button. Everything's nice and, and cool. And plant loves it. But push this button, it gets hot. Plant doesn't like it. Now, I, to me, I was so happy to hear that and to hear the fact that he connected with the one thing that was living in his room and made a connection at that deep level that that was going on. And he couldn't figure out how or what or anything. So it was, he, knew, he remembered the word magic. And he was able to do that. To me, you can, I, I, I didn't give him that plan with that in mind, but he showed he showed me how that little plant, a living thing, could bring life into his confused state. Mm. And when that, that, that's an extreme story, but I think it's that ability to look for what it is that can, or who it is, or maybe it's a tree. Maybe it's a chrysanthemum plant. I mean, no, maybe it's uh, not that. Maybe it's a lizard that, that is living around your house or something, you know, or a, a little uh, mother bird. But whatever it is that's alive and moving and bringing you joy, even in little doses of joy, Hang on to them because they grow and they get better and it goes on, you know. Thank you. So in in a few sentences, how can, with your wealth of years of experience, how can we live our best life? How can we do what? How, how can we live our best life? How can we live our most fulfilled, all-encompassing life? Look for it. You can't, if you're not going to look for it, you won't hear it, you won't see it, you won't do work with it, you know. It won't connect because you have to reach for it. You have to reach for your true humanity. You have to understand 
You don't have to, but I suggest that you <laughs> that you reach for it in a way that really allows you to know that you are a human being who has choice, free will, and can do what you choose. You choose. And everything that comes your way is a teacher. If it's hard, then figure out what you can do about it. To check your dreams. Ask somebody who you, you like, you know, you can uh, talk to about these things. Talk about what you're thinking about. Don't, don't close it up. Don't put it in a drawer and think it's going to stay there. It won't. But, or if it does, it just be a, just darkness. Get it out and look at it. What are the, examine your life. Find out what's there. Because I'm telling you, there are secrets that only you can find for you. No one else is going to find them, but you can find them. So get curious. One more question. You look so amazing, and my gosh, you've li you're living to such an incredible age. Is there a secret to your way of life or your diet or your way of living? I think it's because I found my voice and I have something to live for. And it's something that the world around me gives me joy and happiness and love. My life is so full of love that it's awesome. And I'm always looking for it. And people look back for it. You know, you can look at a person and know if they like you or don't. I remember my uh, grandson, he was three. And when I met, went up to their house, he opened the door and he doesn't let me in. He's standing there looking at me up and down and up and down. Finally, he says, Nani, you're a good pussy. And he walks off and lets me in. It's, it's, it's that watching a little guy like that and all of a sudden, I'm a good person, you know? <laughs> it's, it's listening to what you want to hear, but you don't always hear. And so when you, when you, when you hear something like that, it's a, wow, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I love that. So, well, Dr. Gladys, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. Is there anything you would like to share with the Passion Harvest audience finally that I haven't asked you? Yes, I, I am. We're looking toward the, my 10-year plan of a village for living medicine, where when a person steps onto the ground, your healing starts. And uh, we, I know there are places around the world uh, some people call them blue zones, but they're places where really that's that kind of, the people that live there know the sacred spot, a space. And I really want to build a village for living medicine that um, has a birthing center, that is a loving birth center, that has a sanctuary that has no walls, that has research and education and an aspect of growing into health. Instead of growing old, just allowing ourselves to understand that there is an aspect of health that we could grow, grow old, but grow into health. I love that. What an incredible passion and vision for the future. Dr. Gladys, thank you so much for being on Passion Harvest. My gosh, it's thank been you. such an honour. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. If you liked this episode, please do subscribe.